Amen. Uh, as we come today, I uh, wanted to start a, a three-week series. Uh, I'll be in the pulpit uh, for three more weeks uh, before I take some time off in uh, August. And so I wanted to do a, a three-week series on uh, one word, uh, one word, uh, and that word is nevertheless. Nevertheless, uh, I guarantee you that when we get done with this series, you will never think the same about this word again. Nevertheless. In Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, we read these words. Uh, and it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a drought. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. And when he had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their net brake. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both ships, so they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished, and all that were with him at the draught of the fishes which they had taken. And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, <clears throat> which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. And when they brought their ships to the land, they forsook all and followed him. The title of the series is Nevertheless. Father, we come to you today. And we thank you, Lord, for this powerful story tucked away in the pages of the gospel. And Lord, we ask that you would open our eyes that we might behold wonderful things out of your law and that we might understand that as Peter listened to Jesus and Jesus told him to let down his nets and Peter knew that they had been out there all night and hadn't caught one thing. He said, nevertheless, because you say it, we'll let them out. And so, Lord, we pray that as we look at this, that, that as we come to the nevertheless times in our lives, that we would have a heart of obedience and say, Lord, based upon what you say, I'm going to obey. And so as we get into the word today, we invite the congregation to come and dine. The master's calling, come and dine. You can feast at Jesus' table anytime. He who fed the multitudes and turned the water into wine. Come and dine, the master's calling, come and dine. Feed us, Lord, from your word, for it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. As we look at this word, nevertheless, it is one Greek word with two letters. The word D and the word E. Day. That's all that it is. If you look at it, 
uh, Peter said, day, D-E, day. And various translators have translated this different ways. The New American Standard Bible translates the word day as based upon your word. The NIV translates this two-letter word, but because you say so. The Christian Standard Bible translates the word, but if you say so. Now, a lot of times I feel that other translations make things clearer, uh, still the truth, but they make it clear. But this is one time, this is one time, I think the translators of the King James Bible hit the nail on the head when they used the word nevertheless. As I looked up the word nevertheless in the dictionary, it had these meanings. In spite of one, what one just experienced, nevertheless. We, we've been out here all the night, all night. We've just experienced a night where there was no fish to be caught. Nevertheless, in opposition to what had just happened, we've been out here for the last eight hours. This is what happened. We haven't caught a thing. Nevertheless, without regard to what one went through, what a person just went through, nevertheless. This is a part, this, this two letter Greek word, translated nevertheless, is a powerful word. In spite of what had just happened, nevertheless. Now, there are two sides to nevertheless. On, on the one side, there's failure. We have fished all night and we haven't caught anything. Or on one side, there's a daunting task that you're telling us to let our nets down and we know what the real deal is. On one side, sometimes for people, there's persecution. Sometimes on one side, there's a reason to quit. And what God is trying to do to us is to move us on the other side of nevertheless. Because you see, on the other side of nevertheless, there's faith. On the other side of nevertheless, there's trust. On the other side of nevertheless, there is obedience. On the other side of nevertheless, there is persecu I mean, perseverance. Let me ask you a question. Which side of nevertheless do you live on? Which side do you live on? Do you, do you live on a side? Peter could have very easily said, well, I'm gonna get into, I'm gonna get into what he could have said, so let me, let me hold back on that. Let me hold back on that, because I'm gonna tell you what he could have said, right? Which side of nevertheless are you on in your life? When, when, when God calls you uh, to do something, do, do you stay on the side of failure, daunting tasks, persecution, a reason to quit? Or do you find yourself moving on to the other side of faith, trust, obedience, and perseverance? And, and, and so I want to tell you today that this word, nevertheless, is more than just a word. It's more than just a word. It's an attitude. Nevertheless, it's, 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 a, it's a spirit that, that's within a person. I've made this poem called Nevertheless. I've dreamed many dreams that never came true. I've seen them vanish at dawn. Nevertheless, 
I've seen enough dreams be fulfilled to make me want to dream on. I've prayed many prayers when no answer came. I've waited patient and long. Nevertheless, answers have come enough to my prayers to make me keep praying on. I've trusted a many a friend who failed me and left me to weep alone. Nevertheless, I found enough true friends, true blue, to make me keep trusting on. I've sown many seeds that fell by the way for the birds to feed upon. Nevertheless, I've held enough golden sheaves in my hand to make me keep sowing on. I've drunk the cup of disappointment and pain. I've gone many days without song. Nevertheless, I've tasted enough nectar from the rose of life to make me want to live on. Nevertheless, nevertheless, it's, it's, it's more than a word. It's an attitude. I was reading the story about Evander Holyfield, and he was told over and over and over again, that he was too poor to make anything of himself. He was too inarticulate to make anything of himself. And he was too black to make anything of himself. And I know Evander Holyfield had some struggles as a boxer, but one of the things that he said was, nevertheless, no one chooses his start, but everyone can choose this finish. Nevertheless, they told me I was too poor. They told me I was too inarticulate. They told me I was too black. Nevertheless, no one can choose his start, but everyone can choose his finish. As I look at this series, these three messages, we're going to look at three types of nevertheless found in Scripture. The nevertheless that we are going to look at today goes against reason, nevertheless. Next week, we're going to look at nevertheless that goes against our will. You, 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 you'll know this one. Jesus prayed in the garden of Gethsemane, realizing that he was getting ready to go to the cross. And he was getting ready to drink the dregs of crucifixion, realizing that his spirit was heavy. He began to sweat, as it were, great drops of blood. And he prayed to the Father, Father, if it be possible, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will. So sometimes we have to deal with the, the nevertheless of our will, stuff that we want to do, that God doesn't want us to do. And we have to come to that nevertheless in our lives. And we're going to look at that next week. How do you overcome the nevertheless that goes against the will? And then the nevertheless that goes against death. Paul said in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Y'all know the next word. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. How do you continue? How does a dead man, a dead woman, continue to live? If you've been crucified, with Christ, how do you continue to live? Nevertheless, nevertheless. So that's where we're going for the next three weeks. And today, we are looking at the nevertheless that goes against reason. The nevertheless that goes against reason. Sometimes God will call you to do things that makes absolutely no sense. 
It goes against all reason. But you have to move on the other side of nevertheless. First of all, we see nevertheless, number one, nevertheless. <laughs> Look at this. Look at this. Jesus was a carpenter. Peter was a fisherman. Peter knew what the deal was. Peter knew how the fish worked and he realized if the fish weren't biting that you chalk that up as a bad night and you just move on to the next day. And here you got a carpenter, a man that, that deals with wood. You got him coming and telling you, cast out into the deep and let down your nets. If you go to that next slide, I know that's kind of hard to see, but I, 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 I like what it's saying. Jesus says, row out to deep water and cast your nets for a great catch. And Peter said, no thanks, we're good. No thanks, we're good. Look, man, you don't, look, you don't know what you're talking about. So, you know, that's just, you know, when people say, well, look, man, I'm, I'm good. You know, what, that's just a nice way of telling you to mind your own business. That's, that's just a nice way to tell you to butt out. If somebody says, well, can I, can I do something? No, I'm good. I'm good. And so it went against reason that you have a carpenter telling a fisherman what to do. It goes against all reason. The second thing we see is that they had already cleaned their nets. It makes no sense for this man to come. This is unreasonable. Now, you know, I, I looked up this, this whole thing about cleaning nets, right? And uh, uh, when, you, when you talk about cleaning the nets, it was a process that, that took time. And, and, and cleaning the nets meant that they were getting the debris out of the net, the, the, the weeds and the sand and the pebbles. And, and there was also, uh, you know, the, the live fish would keep uh, uh, moving around, but the dead fish would just get caught in the nets. And if they just let the dead fish in there, uh, it would begin to stink and, and the nets would begin to stink. So they not only had to remove the debris, they had to remove the dead fish. And they also had to mend any tears that were in the net. And so this was, a, this was a process. And so what Jesus was telling them made absolutely no sense. Man, look. We spent all this time cleaning the nets, mending the nets. You are asking something that's unreasonable. Not only are you a carpenter that, that, that don't know fish, but you're asking us to do something unreasonable. And then the third thing. <laughs> what made this request even more unreasonable? We have fished all night and haven't caught anything. Haven't caught nothing. Haven't caught air of fish. <laughs> Zip, zero, zilch. What you're saying makes no sense, Jesus. We've been out, look, look, we just been out here and there's no fish in our nets. And you're telling us to go back out and let our nets down again. Nevertheless, 
What you say is beyond reason. Nevertheless, God, God, God says you need to forgive that person that hurt you. You don't want to, but nevertheless, God is telling you to step out on faith regarding some aspect of your life, and you are struggling to step out on faith. Nevertheless, Master, because you say so, I will do it. Because you say so, <laughs> I will do it. I tell the story about the man that God told to push the rock. And the man pushed the rock. And he pushed the rock for months and months and months. And as he was pushing the rock, one day the devil came by. And the devil said, what are you doing? And the man said, I'm pushing the rock. And the devil said, why are you pushing the rock? He said, because God told me to push the rock. The devil said, but the rock is not going anywhere. And the man began to think. And every day, he would push a little less. As time went by, he took his hands off the rock. Then he began to look at the rock. And then he went and sat down beside the rock. God came along, and God said, what are you doing? And the man said that I was pushing the rock, but the rock did not move. It didn't go anywhere. God said, I didn't tell you to move the rock. I told you to push the rock. And the man let Satan put enough doubt in his mind that he began to disobey what God told him to do. Master, I'm going to do it because you say to do it. If you tell me to push the rock, I'm going to push the rock, regardless of whether the rock moves or not. See, to push the rock a rock that's not moving is unreasonable. But if God tells you to do it, there's a purpose in it. And God told the man, he said, look at your back. Look how strong your back has gotten since you've been pushing the rock. Look at how the muscles in your leg and your arms have developed since you've been pushing the rock. And when we do what God tells us to do, God is working things in us that you might not see, but the results are taking place. You know, I, I don't know how many uh, people over the years have said to me, man, you, you've grown. Now, I'm not talking about since I've been a pastor. I'm talking about as a Christian. Well, I didn't think anything was happening. But God was working out his thing, and he was putting in the special sauce, and he was putting in the formula, and he was working things out because I was obedient to do what he told me to do. There was a man who told his pastor, and maybe some of you feel this way, I'm not coming to church anymore. Because I can't remember any of the sermons that you preached. And the pastor asked him the question. Can you remember what you ate three years ago for lunch? And the man said, no. He said, you can't remember what you ate, but it nourished your body. It kept you alive. And it helped you develop. And it helped you to grow. 
So it is. For those of you who can't remember what Pastor Glaze said last week, you can't remember what the, the title of this message is. Right? Just by you sitting there, you're growing. Just by you sitting there hearing the word of God, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Just by you sitting there, you're growing. By taking in the word, you're, you're growing. That's why I tell people, don't give up. Don't give up on coming to church. Because you're sitting under the word. You're, you're hearing the word. You're being blessed by the word. Keep pushing the rock. Keep pushing the rock. Three elements of Peter's nevertheless. Three elements of Peter's nevertheless. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. There's the element of trust. There's the element of faith. And there's the element of obedience. There's the element of trust. Jesus, what you're saying makes absolutely no sense at all. Nevertheless, I'm going to trust you. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. The word trust means to put your weight on, to, to, to lean on. Don't, don't lean on your own understanding. Don't lean on the way that you can figure things out, but lean on the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Peter said, Lord, I'm trusting you. I, 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 what you're saying, and, and, and Peter, we don't read this in the text, we, we don't read this in the text, so I'm, I'm uh, taking a poetic license, right? I can just imagine Peter saying, Lord, I don't really think that you know what you're talking about. I really don't, because you see, you're a carpenter, I'm a fisherman, but you know what? I'm going to trust you. Now, you, you, you know what makes this thing so incredible? It is the fact that they hadn't been following Jesus that long. Because if you notice in the text what it says, that it was after this that James and John followed Jesus. And so Peter hadn't been following that long. But yet and still, Peter was willing to trust Jesus. Is there a trust behind you're nevertheless. Is there a faith behind your nevertheless? Peter says, at your word, at your word. I love Hebrews chapter 11, the faith chapter. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders received a good report. And it is through faith that we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen are not made of the things which do appear. God framed the world God spoke creation into existence by his word. And notice what Peter says. Nevertheless, at your word. Nevertheless, at your word. Has God spoken to your heart about something? You got to be willing to put faith into what God says. Zig Ziglar, who was a motivational speaker, touched the lives of many people. He said this, you cannot do the right thing long enough and it not pay off. You cannot do the right thing long enough and it not pay off. 
If you are being obedient to the word of God, if you are putting faith in the word of God, it's going to pay off. It's going to pay off. And then, in Peter's profession, there was obedience. There was obedience. I will let down the net. See, your nevertheless has to involve trusting God. It has to involve putting faith in God. And it has to involve obeying what God says. James chapter 1, verses 22 through 25. Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man beholding his natural face in the mirror. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way, and immediately forget what manner of man he was. But whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continuing in it, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Nevertheless, nevertheless. And when you have a nevertheless that goes against reason, that makes no sense, you can be assured that there's a blessing in it somewhere for you. And that's why we see in the conclusion of this passage in Luke chapter 5. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. He, he, he got a fresh look of who God is. That, that when he saw uh, Jesus perform this miracle, he saw Jesus in a way that he had never seen him before. And he fell down at his knees and he said, depart from me, for I am a sinful man. I'm telling you this, that when you have a nevertheless of reason, and you follow what God tells you to do. God will reveal himself to you in ways that you never thought of. God will show himself to you in ways that you have never seen before. For he was astonished, and all that were with him at the draught of fishes which they had taken. And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto him, unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. Not only will you have a fresh revelation of who Jesus is but it's going to do something in your heart it's going to cause you to follow him in ways that you have never followed him before you need to take your walk with God to another level I don't know about you but sometimes I get tired of the mundane the everyday walk I, I feel that that God is calling me to launch out into the deep and let down your net. As I think about this building, the sanctuary, the new sanctuary, God said, launch out into the deep. Launch out into the deep. And, and, and I'm going to show you, uh, uh, you want to get a catch out there that you've never had before. And as I think about where Bethany is, I think that the best of our days and the blessed of our days are ahead of us. There's been some great things that have happened. There's been some great pastors. 
of this church. Pastor Richard Farmer, Pastor Charles Tame, and others that have come before them. Some great men of God. And they took Bethany to places that Bethany had never been before. And I'm hoping as we move ahead, and there'll be somebody after me, that take Bethany to places where we've never been before. I'm looking forward to what's ahead. I believe that the best of our days and the blessed of our days are ahead of us. And God is calling us to launch out <laughs> into the deep. You think God is blessing us with a new sanctuary so we can just go in there and say that we got a new sanctuary, we're going to worship? God is, God, when, when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down. He had a new revelation of God. And not only did he have a new revelation of God, but they had a deeper commitment, a deeper call to service for God. When God fills your net with fish, nevertheless, he's given you a revelation of himself that you've never seen heretofore. And he's also calling you to a deeper level of consecration. You know, I'm pushing 70 years old. Some of y'all tell me, well, you're just a baby. You're just a kid. I understand that. But tell that to my body. So, you know, I've realized, what? That that wick on this end is getting short. But I still believe like Caleb. Lord, I want that mountain. Lord, give me that mountain. It doesn't matter how old we are. There's still mountains in our lives that God has before us. And so, that means if you're younger, man, you ought to be beaming with excitement as to what God has in store for you. Praying that God would, would raise up the next generation of leaders here at Bethany Baptist Church. Those who are going to hold down the doctrine. Those who will uh, fight for the faith. Fight for the morality. That God would raise up a generation of young people. I get excited when I see the group that was singing this morning and the young people that are in the group. That's going to hold it down. And I believe that there's, you know, I, I, I did a uh, survey because I'm trying to put together a leader, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to be done. Somebody say, man, you done, you done left preaching. Now you, uh, right? Uh, you know, I, I put together a uh, uh, a leadership uh, program and just identifying young people. When I asked Naomi, uh, can you give me uh, the names of all uh, the people between the ages of 20 and 40 years old? And you know, we got over 40 people in that category. 40. Hey, there's a next generation. There's a next generation right there. And we need to nurture them. We need to pray for them. We need to bring them along. Because when Pastor Glaze is sitting up in heaven and, and enjoying the fullness of the Lord in his pleasure, there are right hand, at his right hand there are pleasures forevermore. And I'm enjoying the pleasures of the Lord. I don't want to see this place become a, a, night, a, a night joint, right? A disco. Right? Disco might be coming back. I don't, I, don't, I don't want to see this place become a social club. I want to be in heaven, and I want to know. Now, I, I'll be honest with you. I'm going to be so in, in, in involved in heaven that I'm going to be enjoying being in the presence of the Lord. But I still want to know when God says, hey, you know, Bethany, when God gives me the update, hey, Bethany, they're, they're still on point. They're still on point. I want to know that there's people here that's preaching the gospel, that's defending the that's standing up for what's right. And so as I close, let me, let me close this out. Nevertheless, the nevertheless of reason. What is God saying to you today? 
Is he asking you to launch out into the deep waters of faith? Is he calling you to obedience in some area of your life? Is he wanting you to trust him and attempt, attempt the impossible? Is he asking you to be obedient in spending time with him? What is God saying to you today about your never the less? Father, we thank you for your blessings that you have bestowed upon us. And Lord, we ask that you would allow us to do like Peter. Even though sometimes Jesus may ask us to do things that are beyond reason, beyond human reason, we realize that we have to have faith, trust, and obedience and do what it is that you have asked us to do. So Lord, help us to launch out into the deep and cast our nets. Father, I pray that if there's someone that's here today or watching and they don't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, I just want to share with them the ABCs of the gospel. A is admit that you are a sinner. B, believe that Christ died, was buried, and rose again for your sin. And C, confess him. If we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. The ABC. So Lord, I pray that you would touch that individual that might not know you and they would pray and ask Jesus to come into their life and be their Lord and Savior. And if you are here today and, or if you're watching and you want to know more about this great salvation that Jesus has provided, we ask that you would call us at 412-242-3255. Leave us your name and how we can contact with you. And somebody will follow up if you want to know more or if you made a decision for Christ. If you're here today and you want to know more about Christ or you want to hook up with this local church as we give the invitation today, we want to invite you to come.